All righty, as they say at the train station, it's exactly 9 o'clock, so time to start. And we're glad to have everybody here today. Life's going good for you. For those of you, again, wondering about our fearless leaders, I think they're in California or someplace like that. Uh, but anyway, so they told me just to carry on uh, and try not to burn the place down while they were gone. So you know how that is. When your parents leave you at home alone for the first time, and, and it's kind of a scary thought right there. Well, it's good to see everybody. It's uh, gotten a little bit colder on us, but I think we like it that way, right? Right. A lot of you were at the zoo last night, saw a lot of you at the zoo. Some of you escaped, apparently, and got, came back to be with us, so that's good. And uh, always a fun time uh, having it at the zoo. Don't know why we did it on Saturday as opposed to Sunday, which is what we usually do. Because that was the time they could get. Only night the animals would do anything? Okay, I got it. That's right. The animals view Sunday as a day of rest. <laughs> All, all creatures great and small, as we like to say. All right, so good to see you, and let's see what's happening in our world today. We got things, we got announcements to give you, we got prayer requests, we got birthdays, we got all kinds of events that are taking place. It's good to see some that have not been here for a while uh, due to illness or due to travel or whatever, and now they are with us. We also have some who are probably eager to jump up and tell us about loved ones who are with them here today. Is that right, Patsy? That's right. All right, who you got, Pats? I, I have my grandson and his fiance. This is uh, Nick and, uh, and Megan. Nick and Megan are here. They lowered the average age in our class down to 80. So that's good, and we appreciate them being here. Nick was one of my former students uh, in the past. You still left-handed? Yes, sir. Okay, it's making sure. Uh, so, so Nick was in my class, did an excellent job. He was a music kind of person also for school. Is that right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, all right, who, el who else is here that's not normally here? I'm looking for more visitors. We got a visitor? Hi there, buddy. Hello, how's it going, fellow? I'm okay. What's your name? Kent Cannon. Hi, Kent. Glad to have you here. Thank you. All right. We got one back there. What's your name? <coughs> my name's Gary. I rode my bicycle from Branson. Gary's here, rode his bicycle from Branson. He's going to get a prize for something, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I got it. Just the fact that he could ride a bicycle gives <laughs> him a point for that. Right there. All right, still watching people drift in. It's always good to uh, have people arrive. Uh, uh, Nick, are you still, are you on a church staff somewhere? Are you? I'm on a church staff. Okay. Where do you go to church? First Baptist Fort Worth. Fort Worth, First Baptist Fort Worth. Okay, the legendary First Baptist Fort Worth. Yeah, something like that. Look who's back. Yeah, we got uh, we got the uh, the pop, uh, the, our world famous twins, uh, has come back to be with us. Hello there, Dad. Congratulations to you. How how are Smoothie and Burger doing this morning? They're doing great. Good, good. Yeah, they were up here Wednesday and brought their kiddos, and we got to all ooh and ah over them at that time. One of them even came to my Wednesday night thing for a bit. Which one was that? That was Smoothie. That was Smoothie? Okay, good. All right. All right. Looking for other things, other announcements or whatever. All right. A few things that are going to be happening. Well, I'll tell you what, let's shift first. We'll, we'll hold some more announcements till later. Let's shift first into uh, prayer requests. How about some prayer requests right now? Yes, ma'am? Good old Cal Reister. Might even be watching. Hi, Cal, if you're watching. I don't know if you can see. Hold on. Oh, it's upside down. I wonder if that's important. That's right. <laughs> We'll probably get a phone call in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Green, Greenfield's dad, uh, father in law watches. Uh, 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 Yo! 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 Yo!
Oh, good. <laughs> you sure are. Does it look upside down to you, too? <laughs> good. I could turn, I could stand on my head if that would help. That's pretty much. Okay. We want to see that. Yeah, we do want to see that, don't we? And that I'm, didn't help. didn't help. <laughs> That's called the commutative principle in mathematics. <laughs> yes. Oh, there we go. Yes, back to you. Well, for those who didn't know, Cal had a yeah. small... No, we, <laughs> we have heard from the official Reister family, and uh, <laughs> Cal did have kind of an ocular uh, stroke of some kind in the back of his brain, and had a lot of uh, dizziness and eyesight issues, and so he went into the hospital yesterday, and they couldn't decide if they wanted to keep him or not, and so they said, we're not keeping you, and they sent him home, and so he is at home, and we are certainly... Uh, in prayer for Cal and Donna, and uh, continue to appreciate immensely everything that they do for us. Yes, ma'am? She woke up with a headache this morning, but I bet he feels better now because she said that he had his uh, Sunday morning biscuits. His Sunday morning biscuits. That's for sure. She used to bring some up here and give them to people. But uh, I know. So, oh, let me see. You got another one over here. How are we doing? Um, uh, my dad is back. Home down. Okay. Good. So Jerry Holman has right. returned to the house. So uh, tell him hello for us. And if you're watching here, hello for you. All right. Anybody else? Rose? Let's have a praise because Madame Frush is back with us at last. Yeah, Frush has returned finally. And so life is uh, back to being uh, wonderful. Saw her at the zoo last night, too. She didn't know where the blue chair <laughs> they were burgundy the last time I were here. Oh, the chairs were a different color? Are you sure? Are you making that up or what? I, I walked in very confused. Okay. Yes, she was. And what's different? Okay, but anyway. Uh, any other prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, big, uh, big bad things happening in this world. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And we got one going on right now over in Israel to join the one that's going on in Ukraine. And so it's uh, good to have, uh, uh, to remember the world as we do in our prayers. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, anything else? Oh, good, we got our good friend coming in. Excellent, excellent. Hello there. They told us to wait for you, and we said, forget it, we're starting without her. <laughs> this class is built on uh, friendship and family and fun, and you have to have high self-esteem to be in here. <laughs> All right, well, why don't we uh, begin today, then, with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do in our lives. We have good reports. We thank you for uh, the recoveries of Cal and Sister Fresh and Jerry Holman and all of these wonderful, wonderful people who mean so much to us. We also know that we continue to pray for many people who uh, would need a healing touch from your hand right now. We also know that our world hurts and people do a lot of terrible things around our world. So we pray for your overall control and interaction with what takes place and with your presence in all times of trouble, be it Ukraine or Israel or any other place where violence has gotten out of hand. So Father, we thank you that as a church we can continue to serve you and further the kingdom of God more than the kingdom of people. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, thank you, thank you for coming in. We've got more people coming in. We, that's called praying them in. We used to do that back in the old days at the Brush Harbors. Hi, Jeff Gooden. Good to see you. Do you know what a Brush Harbor or a Bible is? I think so. Kind of good. All right. Yeah, I know. He doesn't know. Okay, let me give you a few announcements. Uh, how many of you were there last Wednesday night for the lady from the Texas... Tech School Pharmacy. Okay, good, good. Got to hear about some 
uh, current trends in pharmaceutical medicine. Remember on Wednesday nights at 4 o'clock, if you're out and about, uh, head on over, uh, well actually it's in this room, I believe, yes? Okay, it's in this room. So this uh, Wednesday, October the 11th, okay, uh, we're going to have the police. The police are going to be here to arrest all you drug people. And uh, Officer Carrie Adkins with the Abilene Police Department will be discussing ways to prevent scams from occurring. So uh, come on out for that at 4. Remember, you come to this at 4, you go to uh, the dinner at 5, then you go to whatever uh, 6 o'clock thing you decide to go to, and it's just a great evening uh, in the church. we got that intergenerational Bible study stuff, and then we got uh, one, maybe two, one more uh, or two Wednesdays of our church history class. And so lots of things you can do on Wednesday to... Help your week along. Then after that, on the 18th, there'll be a local attorney discussing wills and trust. It's it's not Lynn. No. 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 Okay. Good. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> if he had if he had any if he had any feelings, it'd have been hurt. All right. Uh, and then after that, our good buddy Ken Lyle will be uh, doing a Bible study also for you. So that's a fun thing to do on Wednesday. We're glad about that. All right, uh, still see people looking at their phones. I don't know if that means we're right side up or not. We're okay, Jeannie? Gail says we're upside down. Gail says we're upside down. Okay. Maybe we were, maybe it needs to be upside down. And we were right side up right there. Okay, we'll flip it back around. Tell Gail to look again. Yeah, tell Gail she's upside down. <laughs> All right. Hi, Gail. Good to see you. All right. But anyway, uh, we're going to try to fix these things. Uh, electronics in the hands of old people, dangerous thing. That's for sure. I'm not saying you're an old person. I am. I had a birthday yesterday. Did you? <laughs> I'm older. Not every day somebody turns 40, right? All right. <laughs> Speaking of birthdays, that's called a segue in the radio industry. Uh, we do have a few birthdays to give you. Uh, what day is today? Hey. Eighth of October. October, which of course October is the eighth month on the Roman calendar, which is why it's named October. Uh, it's the tenth month on our calendar, but the eighth on the old Roman calendar. So, things you learn in here, I'm telling you. All right, our good friend Stacy Gray is having a birthday today. Way to go, Stacy Gray. Uh, then the ninth, that's tomorrow, right? Glenn Talent. Y'all know Glenn Talent? He's quite a guy on the 9th. And I think that's it. That's it for the birthdays this week. Unless some of our visitors, oh, I lost him already. Uh, he left his jacket. He'll be back. Okay, here he is. Uh, Branson guy, do you have a birthday this week? Okay. Uh, Kent, do you have a birthday this week? No. Oh, rats. Okay. All right. How about the young people? Birthdays this week? No. Okay, good. Just don't want to miss anybody along the way. All right. Okay, other than that, then, I think we're pretty much set and ready to go. And uh, we're doing the book of Galatians chapter 6. Merkel Man says it's 6. All right. <laughs> Everybody has a purpose in life. You found yours. Uh, Thank you. How many chapters in Galatians? Six. Oh. So we're heading to the end. Uh, I don't know if there's any outlines or whatever on the back table. If there are, you can have anything you want on the back table, uh, free of charge. And uh, if I have any Galatians outlines or whatever up here, Galatians. Still, people I still see people wandering around looking at their phones. Always makes me nervous. Hi, Lynn. Good morning. Galatians 6, let's take a look at this. This is the wrap-up. 
if you remember, and, and for all of you who do have uh, high jars, who do have a, uh, an outline or whatever, just a r reminder, we might even finish today, we'll have to think about that, but uh, the letter is written in three parts. The first two chapters are the autobiographical, confessional, give my testimony part by Paul. The middle two chapters, three and four, are the theology part of the letter. This is why you don't add stuff to Jesus. You don't need anything else besides Jesus for salvation. Uh, don't let anybody deceive you about that. And then chapters five and six is where he's turning it all practical. How do we put this into uh, into our lives? How is it going to impact anything? Remember the the high water mark, the theme of the book is chapter five, verse one. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Remember that part? Okay. So then we uh, saw the end of chapter 5 last week, which talks about the uh, uh, deeds of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, remember the key verb that gets used all the time <coughs> is walk. Walk by the Spirit. Walk in what God has given us. That's a, that's a command that we have all throughout all throughout the book, because that denotes consistency. Moving along, walking. Here's your fancy word for today. Peripatetic. That's your fancy word for today. Have you used that word today? Not me. Okay, just checking. Uh, peripatetic. <laughs> peripatetic. I only have this big of vocabulary. I got you. Peripatetic <laughs> means to, to walk around. There are per peripatetic uh, philosophers back in those old days. They would teach as they walked around. You have peripatetic professors. I remember I walked around in class all the time while I was teaching and stuff. But uh, it means to walk around. Perith is around like perimeter. So uh, uh, when you live a life as a believer, you have a peripatetic life. You're, you don't just, you're not just a Christian when you're in this building. Uh, somebody I'm Maybe the preacher or somebody was talking about the church is not just a building. Uh, you are the church. Well, you're, you're a believer even when you're not in this church, when you're out in the world walking around, when you're doing community activities, when you're, happening, uh, when you're helping in city life, when you're attending sporting events, when you're doing any of those things, you are a believer. So you go to uh, chapter 5, walk, 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 walk. You get over to chapter 6, and we were talking about... Um, how in our life we're supposed to be very responsible for what we do, but we're also supposed to try to help people get through their issues in life. So back it up a little bit um, about forgiving each other. 6-1, if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore, there's a command, restore one another, restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, looking to yourself lest you be tempted. And then here's the command again, verse 2, bear one another's burdens. That's part of why we do social ministry, social ministry at our church, missions around the world. Many of you have been on the missions events that our church does. Um, City Life, other types, Big A, all those mission things that we do. We're bearing other people's burdens because that fulfills. Now, I always think he picks his words interestingly. If you go back to verse 2, it says, if you do that, it fulfills the law of Christ. What's he been hammering on for six chapters? The law is not going to save you. But once you understand what saves you, which is Jesus, well, then you have regulations and things you ought to do and bigger issues in life that you ought to be involved with. So it's interesting that he does talk about the law of Christ. Uh, so that's, that's why we're supposed to bear each other's burdens. Um, so we got down to about verse 5. So you put, this is interesting, if you put 2 and 5 together, gives you 7. No, that's not it. <laughs> bear one another's burdens, verse 5, each one should bear his own load. There you go. So we are to take responsibility for our lives, live the way you should live, fulfill all the things the Lord wants you to do, but also part of that is being willing to help other people when they haven't done all the things they should do. So that's, that's a much grander scheme. See, that you could just say, well, I'm going to live the way I'm supposed to do, and I'm not going to worry about anybody else. 
but we do live the way we're supposed to, but then we also look for ways to help others. And everybody in the room has done that. They've, we've all helped people as a, as a class, as a church, as individuals. So I think we're down to about verse 7. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that they will reap. So you go back to chapter 5, where he talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Well, that's what we sow. That's what we reap. We reap the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. And on and on he goes. That's what we reap. When you live the way you're supposed to live, you follow the Lord the way you're supposed to follow, you have this kind of fruit in your life. And if you live perhaps the way you shouldn't, according to this verse, you reap certain things. He further defines it in verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. This continues on his practice. He started this back in chapter 5. On one side you got the flesh, on the other side you got the Spirit. So he started talking about the deeds of the flesh, and now the one who reaps, the one who sows to the flesh, reaps. What do you reap? Corruption? My Bible says corruption. Is that what you said? Yep. Verse 8? Okay. But those that sow to the Spirit, what do you reap? Life everlasting. Life everlasting, eternal life. So that's why this section is so practical. He's trying to let you know the Lord saves you and the Lord only saves you. How are you going to make it work in your life? Paul had this funny idea that what's on the inside is supposed to come out on the outside. And what's on the outside shows what's on the inside. He, he, he would not know about separating the two. Oh, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to live any jolly well I want to, any jolly way I want to live. And he wouldn't know anything about that. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I just wanted to point something out. Notice he says in verse 8, so does to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, so the spirit will reap everlasting life. Right. Notice he says will. There's no uncertainty there. Right. There's a direct cause and effect, and so oftentimes as Christians, we it's easy to get discouraged that uh, if we're doing things that uh, out of faith. Right. It, 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 in our eyes, maybe in the here and now, it doesn't look like it's going to make any difference. It's, it's, it, we can never escape the biblical principle of sowing what we reap, and there will be a reaping sometime in the future, even though we can't envision it now. It does make a difference. Yeah, Paul's letting these Galatians know that. Uh, and, and thus us, letting, letting them know that there is a future for all of us and we're on that journey right now, on that path. And as believers, sure, we might mess up, we might, not, we, we might get discouraged, as you said, but we still have that eternal life coming our way. Rose? Larry, would you comment on the Greek verb there? In the King James, uh, it says, we shall reap. Shall is stronger than will. Sure. And I wonder if the Greek has any indication of how strong this problem no, it, it's just kind of a it's just kind of a looking to the future, heading towards that direction. That's right. It's just for Paul when he's writing to help these people understand what's happening in their life. They cannot get deceived, swallowed up, thrown off course by the Judaizers who we've been talking about. They need to live according to the way the Lord wants them to live, and what they have in the future is eternal life, hope. They're going to make it. It'll be great. It'll be wonderful. Verse 9, that's why he says, building on what has been said here, let us not lose heart in doing good. Because you can at times. You can get you know, a little tired or wondering if any of this is helping anybody. You see the same old people all the time when you're helping them out, and you just wonder, Am I, are we wasting our time? Oh, no, he says don't lose heart. Don't lose heart in doing good, because in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Stay at it. Enjoy the life you have with the Lord. See, too many times our world, we live on immediate answers. I do this, I get this. I have students like that all the time. If I do this, do I get this? And you have to understand, we do this because we're supposed to do this. 
And then we let God take care of this over here. And in due time, if we don't, if we don't give up in due time, we'll have all those things that the Lord promises to us. Um, so while we have the opportunity, verse 10, let us do good to all, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So do good to all, and he says, especially our brothers and sisters. We we'll look for ways to help people. Everybody in the room can talk about uh, times that the church or people in the church have been so uh, beneficial to you, praying for you, helping you along the way. Uh, it's just that's part of, of life. That's part of the family of God that we are in. So you can see why these are, these are words of encouragement that Paul has for the Galatians as he's closing down uh, this letter. And again, remember to put it in some kind of a, a physical context. Remember what's probably happened is they've all gathered together and somebody is up here reading this letter to them. So they can hear, they can hear that voice of Paul. They can hear that voice of God as it's encouraging all of them. Let us, let us all do good, as he says. So you, you have that, that vocalness behind this letter. Now, he says something interesting in verse 11. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. That's good. <laughs> I don't know if he took his number one pencil from him. <laughs> Big as a horse's leg. Remember those? Uh, he has already alluded to the fact in this letter that the Galatians had helped him out in the past and that he probably has some kind of an eye issue, an eye difficulty. And... Uh, we also know from an earlier letter that he wrote called Second Thessalonians that uh, he, he began to take the, uh, whatever you want to say, pen, stylus, feather from his amanuensis and he would jot in a few words of his own at the end so that everybody would know it's really a letter from him. Because apparently in Second Thessalonians there may have been a, a fake letter show up. But so it looks like that's what he's doing here as he's beginning to close down this letter to the Galatians. He's saying, okay, here's a reminder, it's, it's me. Look with what large letters I am writing to you of my own hand. Uh, that is a word we know, isn't it? Amanuensis? <laughs> yes. Okay, I got to know. I got some yeses. <laughs> You're going to get two big words in the same day? Well, this is my honor Sunday school class, right? <laughs> All right, amanuensis. Have you heard that word before? Okay, what is it? <laughs> it's, it's a big old word, that's all I know. It's a word you can use in, in Scrabble. Uh, yeah, it's a writing secretary, scribal assistant kind of a person. Normally in that culture, a rabbi would be talking and a person would be writing it all down, uh, you know, based on what the person was saying. So not everybody in that day and age, obviously, could read and write, and scribal... Uh, work was a paid job, and so uh, typically, if Paul's like any other rabbi, that's sort of what he's doing with these letters. He's talking, and the amanuensis is writing it, and then Paul says, here, let me have that, and he'll jot in a few words on his own, so they'll know it's actually from him. Reminding you of the physicality of the Bible, how it got produced, and how it got put together, and, and the, the uh, I always... Uh, I think my, my class at school gets tired of hearing me say the word reality, how real this is. This is not just a mystical, fluffy book that, that arrived on our doorstep. <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Spencer. Well, I was just going to suggest. Oh. With what large letters? I really think that uh, his eyesight was probably affected by the blinding light on the Damascus Road when he met Christ. Even in this letter earlier, had said, uh, come complimented them saying that they would have plucked out their own eyes and given them to him. That's right. They knew he was almost blind or he had difficulty seeing and all that. Every time I go to the bank and I sign that electronic tablet, I say to the lady, if I were you, I wouldn't accept this thing. That's right. And my wife has perfect penmanship and she chides me and tells me to slow down. I think Paul could have done it simply because physically, he, with his eyesight, he couldn't see small print. That's right. So he had a large print Bible, I'm sure, and he <laughs> signed his name that way. <laughs> or it could have been that Paul 
have you ever written something down and then if you wanted your students to really pay attention, you printed it about twice as large as you would normally write. Right. Or you would say write it in red and underscore it with, and circle it in red. And that's to, that's to authenticate and to get their attention focused on that one thing. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Because he, he is, probably had not only bad eyesight, he, yeah. he had malaria yeah. and the recurring headaches that are so severe that you cannot see it blurs the vision. That could possibly be part of what he's saying. Yeah, and again, a reminder to us that Paul is not Jesus. Paul's a person, like you and me. And so he wrestled with these same things in his own life, he, from a spiritual standpoint, from a physical standpoint. All of you are not as spry as you used to be, I was going to say 20 years ago, uh, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Some of you have read readers. I've seen people put them on their head and then bring them back down while that happens. How old is the earliest extant text of Galatians? Oh, we don't, we don't uh, have anything with Galatians that would probably be before the third century yeah so it you know through the study of textual criticism and whatever we can we can trust that what we have is reliable and is what we need we don't have the original though so you know why would they have saved some letter but it came to be seen as the word of god the holy spirit inspired it and got collected canonizing editing putting things together in your scriptures now we've said this before we don't have the original of any book in the in the Bible, but uh, what we have is the most well attested piece of ancient literature uh, in existence. Don't lose a moment's sleep over wondering about the reliability of your of your scripture, Brother Spencer. Uh, hi, Larry. I have one other thing. Okay. <laughs> um, he's when he said he writes in such large letters. Uh, I think it may also have a veiled reference to what he's about to say as he closes this letter. Right where he says, I bear in my body the right. marks of Jesus. Right. I think he, with his eyesight that was dim, possibly because of Damascus, etc., he's going to say, probably he's referring with the marks in his body, the beatings and the scourgings and the stoning he had endured. He had physical marks in his body. And I think that he saw his eyesight as something that blinded him so that when he fi finally had his eyesight restored, he, it was not just his eyes, but it was his spirit so he could understand that law was not the way to God or the means right. to God. It was grace by faith in Christ. So uh, maybe his eyesight was part of the physical marks he's going to talk about. Yeah, I think that's a good thing too, Brother uh, Darrell. Uh, sorry. Brother Wood? Yes. I keep looking around at different people at different yeah. times. The word here is stigmata. Yeah, that'll be in verse 17. That is correct. Yeah, verse 17. Yeah. We're jumping ahead a little bit. We're good at that. Stigmata, like Dr. Spencer was saying, are mark, marks in the body from right. his beatings and from his shipwrecks and mm -hmm. hardships uh, for the Lord. And that stigmata also can indirectly refer to the scars on our psyche, mm -hmm. suke, the soul, mm -hmm. the mind, the spirit. If we're really being faithful to the Lord, then we're going to bear in our bodies the marks of that obedience. Right. Yeah, I think that's where I think we're I think we all sort of have an idea where Paul's going with his closing of his letter. Um if we are bearing our load, as he said earlier in chapter 6, you know, things may happen to us, things in life. Many of you in this room have, have had difficulties in life, you've had health difficulties, you've lost loved ones, you've had bad things happen, you've had good things happen also. But it's just life, it's part of life. And you bear up and you keep going and, and look around every so often, take inventory and oh, you got some marks here based on what happened to you along the way. 
So I think that what Paul is doing as he's wrapping this letter up is he's trying to remind the Galatians about how important their everyday life is and the ministry that they have in caring for others who go through the same kind of difficulties. You know, you can think of uh, some of our fellow Sunday school members who aren't here today because of reasons that they didn't choose, and those people have helped others quite a bit, and now people are helping them. This is, this is the way we work. Uh, especially when he said, where was that back in verse uh, 10? And especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's us. We're the household of faith. You could, that could be the name of our church, Household of Faith Baptist Church. There you go. But anyway, so you can see as he's bringing, once he says, see with what large letters I'm writing, you know he's heading towards the end of the letter because that's what he tended to do towards the end. So then he comes and wraps it up on one last warning for them along the way. Those who desire to make a good showing, I'm in verse 12, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised. Now, now see, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh, that's the Judaizers. That's the people swooping in saying, you've got to do this, 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 and this, and this shows that I'm better than you or you're better than somebody else if you adopt my way of doing things. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised. Simply that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So they think, uh, the, the Judaizers think that they're doing the right thing by forcing Gentiles to become Jewish. Uh, remember we used the word proselyte uh, sometime in the past. So he says that's what they're trying to do. Uh, and it's for all the wrong reasons. Because you have to understand, even if they did that, even if they got you to switch over, even if that made them feel like they are really something and doing exactly what the Lord wanted them to do, verse 13, those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves. The day you set out to earn your salvation, you will lose. Because there's no way in the world you can keep all of the laws. This is what Paul's telling them. That, so he's saying that's why this is that's why this this uh, bill of goods that they're trying to sell you is not going to work anyway. Because even they who think that they're better than you, they don't even keep the law themselves. He's saying use logic as you think about your relationship with the Lord. Go ahead. The uh, <clears throat> statement: the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted. Mm -hmm. I'd remind everybody that at this point in time in history, Jews, Jewish religion was a legal, accepted religion by the Roman government. Christianity really was mm -hmm. not formally legalized. It right. was an illicit or illegal religion. And one of the arguments the Judaizers <clears throat> used against the Galatian Christians was, look guys, if you become, if you're circumcised and you accept the law and you become like a Jew, the Romans aren't going to persecute you. And I, nobody said that, but I thought I'd just point that. That's, no. That was a powerful argument. Yeah, it is. Because in that day, uh, even when Nero and Domitian were the first two emperors to start officially persecuting Christians, Jews were off the hook. Romans recognized Judaism as a religion that had been around as long as them, at least, so they let it go. But Christians, you're in big trouble. And see, today some guys become Christians because it's financially uh, mm -hmm. expedient to do that. Yeah, I understand. So that's, that's the point. Anytime you try to add a bunch of stuff simply for non-spiritual reasons, Paul's saying it's not going to work. In fact, he's heading towards a humongous statement. Let's, let's watch him get up there. Verse 13, those who are circumcised don't even keep the law themselves. They desire to have you circumcised. Why? That they may boast in your flesh. Look, here's some more that I got converted over to us. Here's some more that we have now uh, proselyted them. I wonder how many times we were around saying, look, here's some more that we changed over to being Baptist. <laughs> here's some more that we did this, this, and this for Always have to be careful about what we're boasting in. Yep. You're not supposed to boast 
in yourself. You're not supposed to boast in others. You're supposed to boast in the Lord. Verse 14, but may it never be. May genita, very strong uh, pronouncement in, in Greek. May it never be. What does everybody's Bible say? May I never boast. You know, may it never be that I should boast. Except, what's he going to boast in verse 14? The cross of Jesus. The cross of Christ. Remember, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified in Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. So that's that's what we base everything, I, I hope. That's what a church, our church, bases everything on, is the redeeming power of the cross of Christ. For all of you who've been to, of course, the famous Logsdon Chapel with the world's greatest stained glass window, you know, right in the middle of the window is the cross. On the other side, you got the open Bible, and on the other side you got the descending dove representing the giftedness of the Holy Spirit, but in the middle, the cross. May I boast only in the cross of Christ. Think of all those hymns that we sing about the cross. Such great, great verbiage that we put together. May it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, meaning the world's dead to me, and I to the world. You know, I'm not going to be saving the world, Paul says. Nobody has salvation in anything except in the Lord. And that's why the really big, again, if you like to underline and color in your Bible, verse 15 is the big one. Neither is circumcision anything. And you expect him to say that. Sure, he's been fighting that for six chapters. You, you expect him to say, circumcision is nothing. But then he says, uncircumcision is nothing. So he says, neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision. But what is the important thing? Yeah, my Bible says a new creation. Does yours say that? a new creation. I don't create, you don't create, people don't create, God creates. You know, even these people that just had two little bitty ones, they didn't create them. God created them. So he says, of course, what I've been telling you for six chapters, circumcision's nothing. But let me remind you, neither is uncircumcision. So all you Gentiles say, woohoo, I don't have to do that, I'm, I'm great as I... No, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is a new creation. Are you a new creation? Have you been created in Christ Jesus? That's the key, he says. So that's why it's such a... Uh, it doesn't surprise you at the start of 15, it does surprise you in the middle of 15, and then it brings back the ultimate truth at the end of 15. Created in Christ Jesus. That's, that's another term he'll use in another letter. And so if that's true, what I just said in 15 is true, then verse 16, and those who will... Do you have this word? Walk. Walk. Do you have that word in your Bible? Some of you may, uh, may not. The different translations, let me see here. <laughs> King James has walk. <laughs> Okay, those who follow. Okay, that's a good one. Here. Those who follow this rule. That's the New International Version. Those who will walk by this. Once again, he uses a word that surprises. He uses the word rule. He used law earlier. He used rule now. He's been stressing the freedom of Christ. Uh, but the idea here is when we understand what God wants us to do, then all you got to do is walk. In that freedom, all you got to do is follow in that freedom. And when you walk by this rule, peace and mercy will be upon you. Now, I, I don't know if he's... When, when I read those words, I kind of think, you know, peace, that's me. Mercy, that's what we give to others. Sometimes we're not very merciful. 
Sometimes we're very judgmental. But when we walk the way the Lord wants us to walk, when we realize that we're a new creation, well then we have peace. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't have troubles in your life, there won't be wars around the world, and it won't mean that you don't get sick and go to the hospital, but you'll have peace in your life, and peace in your relationship with the Lord. But then you also are able to give mercy to others. That's why we minister. Peace and mercy will be upon them and upon the... Now, there's an interesting phrase. You have the Israel of God. Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's an unusual phrase. Mm -hmm. Upon the... I'm looking here in the, the Israel of God. Yeah. Because see, what did the Judaizers say? We're Israel. You are Gentiles. You need to try to become Israel. <laughs> As Paul says in this letter and Romans and some other places, the, the followers of Jesus become his chosen people, his Israel. So Gentiles who, who are a new creation, congratulations, you're Israel. You may not have been born that way, but you are because God made you a new creation. And there may be people walking around in Paul's day, maybe the Judaizers, I don't know, who would say that they're Israel and they might not be Israel. I don't know. See, Paul, this is not an eth uh, ethnical thing. This is not a national patriotic kind of thing. This is a spiritual thing he's talking about. You are God's chosen people. In this room, you know Jesus, you're God's chosen people. So now we get to the verse that we've already kind of looked ahead to because, once again, he's wrapping up the letter. I'm through talking about all this, Paul says. So from now on, verse 17, let no one cause trouble for me. <laughs> Who, who's causing him trouble? The Judaizers are causing him trouble. Uh, the Galatians who felt compelled to change over to what the Judaizers were teaching were causing him trouble. Starts that maybe Mrs. Paul. No, sorry. Uh, let no one cause trouble for me, he says. And we said, well, why not? And here's where Brother Spencer and Brother Wood have helped us understand that he has, let's see what, your, what word your Bible says. Mine says, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the, my Bible says, brand marks of Jesus. Scars. Marks. S scars. Scars. Marks. Okay. Here's your third big word today. Although this is actually just a foreign word. Well, thanks for clearing that up. Well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I almost forgot the accent mark. <laughs> that makes a big difference. That's right. It makes a big difference. I'm telling you. This is also the term to the marks of Christ, the marks in his hand and the marks in his side, which are said to have appeared on St. Francis of Assisi and others. But anyway, they are the signs of Christ's suffering. Yeah, uh, the Greek word is, is stigmata, and uh, it, it does talk <laughs> about the physical uh, marks that would be left on a person. Uh, not just Jesus, but I mean anybody who had been injured in battle or something of that nature and had a scar or something that could be seen as a stigmata upon that person. Uh, what Rose is talking about, of course, is throughout church history, many people have, have felt that, that at times they have experienced uh, wounds <coughs> in hands and, and on sides uh, that were supernaturally called uh, stigmata. Uh, so if you ever hear that term used in, in <coughs> church history or medieval studies or something, that's what, that's what they're talking about. Uh, for Paul, he doesn't, I don't think he has scars on his hands and his side, but he's, uh, as Brother Wood said, you know, he, in, in his own letter, uh, 2 Corinthians, 
he gave you a little listing of all this kind of stuff he had been through, beatings and in the deep and, and had he'd been stoned a couple of times. And so he had physical issues in his life, eyesight stuff also. So he's got all these scars of life. You know, this is a reminder. I, yeah, we don't have a, uh, every so often I tell my class, there's no real answer to this, so just say what you think. <laughs> uh, in your mind, how old is Paul when he's writing this letter? He's 60. He's old. <laughs> Wait, I mean, I'm wounded. He said 60 is old. I'm wounded. Of course, you do think that that's old, don't you? <laughs> Go ahead, Darrell. I think the fact that Paul recognized very much so his weakness, the weaknesses, plural, mm -hmm. and we all have weaknesses, plural. Mm -hmm. We all have disabilities or liabilities, but if we can recognize that our weakness is our strength mm -hmm. if we find the strength in the Lord and not in our own strength. In other words, Paul's weakness became his strength because he was totally dependent upon God for what he accomplished. Physically, he couldn't do it by himself. And yet God, through the power the empowering, sure. enabling, sustaining of the Holy Spirit in one's life is what makes it possible to be and do the things that we are. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's, it's one more example to us of the reality of this issue that this man, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing all this stuff to them about real life issues. Um, how old he was? Don't know for sure yet. We'll talk about that some more in a minute. Are you going to say something? Well, I don't know how old he was. Okay. That's one reason I was looking to you. <laughs> one other thing that certain commentators have mentioned regarding the marks. It's not, uh, it was a well-known fact that in that day and age, uh, slavery was rampant, and the slave owner was quite often brand, literally brand his, uh, some of his slaves, sometimes right on the forehead. So he, you know, and uh, that way they would be able to be marked there. And that Paul the Apostle, when he became Paul, transitioned from Saul, uh, he refers to himself in his new, as the new creation, as a bond slave or a servant of Jesus Christ. And I think what uh, referenced a moment ago, Daryl, it's not just the physical stigmata, you know, the beatings and the, and the and, you know, the being shipwrecked and bitten by, you know, I'm just saying physically, you know, old cowboys, you could you, you tell them they were cowboys because they'd ridden a horse along, they were bow-legged, that was a physical mark. So they walked that way. Well, he served Christ and he suffered for Christ and endured every kind of hardship and difficulty and it takes its toll. I mean, your face is weathered but and your heart and spirit, but the remarkable thing was that while it hardened his body, it softened his spirit and his soul and enriched him. So uh, I think that, you know, we sometimes, my wife and I will be eating out, you can see people and observe them and you can tell whether they're Christians or not. Whether they say a word or whatever they do, it's their attitude, their actions, their perspective, the way they consider others, etc., etc. And I think Paul was saying, uh, you know, I can't give you a card that says I'm a card carrying bona fide, except for Christian, but my lifestyle and even my looks and my actions, you can tell I've been. I kind of wonder what marks you and I have on our lives. Uh, all of us have had a journey to get here. Uh, again, back to my unanswerable questions. Pa Paul's probably, um, if I guess, in 55 or so, about the time of this letter. 
uh, there's only one letter, Philemon, where he does refer to himself as an old man. Uh, it's probably in the 60s in that one. But, uh, sorry, Lynn. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we've all, we've all been through the struggle. That's one thing about teaching this kind of thing to a class like us, who most of us are a little bit older. Uh, we know where we've been, but we also know that while we're here, there's still things to do. Um, what did Paul say in Philippians? To, to live as Christ and to die is a gain? Hmm. So, no matter the age, no matter what he's been through, he says, why are we causing trouble for each other? Why are the Judaizers causing trouble for me? I have, I have these marks. Physical, emotional, spiritual. I got them. Wayne? Larry, I think that it's uh, important to recognize that looking at all of Paul's suffering, uh -huh. his sight, the marks on his body, mm -hmm. his criticisms, being run out of town, being stoned. Sure. I think that the fact that he was there and he's teaching this lesson, the experiences of his life give great credibility to his teaching. Mm -hmm. If you take all the experiences of Paul and apply it to verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, right. for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Right. Here's a man that's been beaten, stoned, can hardly see, and he's teaching encouragement. Mm -hmm. uh, Carries great credibility not only with the uh, Galatians, but with you and me. I, I believe that's true. See, that's the kind of things that's what makes this chapters 5 and 6, but especially 6, so practical. All of these words are resonating with us, and we have 50, uh, 40 different applications in our own lives how this is speaking to me, how it's speaking to you, how it's speaking to Nick, whatever. It's all, it has a certain application. That's what God's Word does. It comes in, slices, and we live because of it. What, how are we going to carry on and not, Wayne's Word, faint not, we're not going to grow weary. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen the day after that? What's going to happen next week? We just live every day for Him. That's why he comes to his very last sentence, and we'll be bringing everything to a close today. We're finishing Galatians. What a deal. <clears throat> Verse 18. Typical, what we call salutation. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, which again, putting those three words together, he did the same thing up in verse uh, 14, boasting in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And then what's he called? Brothers? Brethren? Whatever your Bible says there. Remember, he is not, well, especially when he started this letter, he was not happy. But even though he's not happy, they're still his family members. They're still his brothers and sisters in the Lord. There's still a sense of encouragement, a sense of bearing each other's burdens. He's even having to help bear their burdens by them getting mixed up with the Judaizers. They're all in this together as a family. You and I in this class, in this department, in this church, all in this together. When? Larry? <clears throat> Could not in that verse the word grace be replaced with peace? Well, sure, the salutation of, of grace is, is normal for Paul, but sure, the peace. What a contrast between that in the end mm -hmm. and what he was in the beginning. Right. Yeah, because he wasn't happy, especially at the start. I am so amazed that you were deserting him. Mm -hmm. And now he says, grace, and we've heard the word peace, and we've heard the word hope, and we've heard the word faith, and and he calls them my brothers and sisters. Well, you made it through a whole letter. <laughs> One more comment. Okay. We're closing, so hurry. 
appreciate what Wade had to say. I yeah. didn't get the nail on the head. Yeah. When Paul's wrapping up this letter, this hot, white hot letter of anger and frustration and concern. And he had said in this letter, in essence, the law doesn't apply to us as it did to the <coughs> Judaizers and what they're telling don't buy. It's all grace. And then because some of those guys would take, okay, if I don't have to adhere to the law, the law doesn't restrict me that much. I'm, I'm free. There's freedom in Christ. He set me free. So no matter how I sin or what I do, I, my sin paid for by Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm free. And he says in the end, you be careful. What you reap is what you're going to sow. You know, I ask people a question every now and then. When you get where you're going, where will you be? What? Well, the Christians need to understand why we have been set free because of what Christ has done. We're not free to sin like we want. We're free to not sin by the power and grace of the Spirit. But even in doing that, you better be careful about judging others. You need to help others and be careful that you don't... If you find someone a trespass, and that word means an inadvertent, unintentional sin, that we trip and fall or slip on icy sidewalks, not that we decide we're going to murder somebody and, and get away with it. That's a different deal. But the word he uses is an unexpected, inadvertent sin we commit. And restore them gently. And then he says something about burden bearing and burden sharing and finally wraps up and he reminds him. John and Peter, Jesus told Peter what was going to happen to him. And John, Peter asked, well, what about John? Well, don't you worry about him. We can, there is a price to be paid, paid when you become a Christian. Paul kept saying, I have been crucified with Christ. And Jesus said, you've got to die to self so Christianity is going to cause marks in our lifestyle and body. It, there's a price to be paid, but it's well worth it. Yeah. That's called life insurance. Yeah. Well, as the choir members have told us, we're coming to the end of the time here. So let's pray, and then we'll pick all, uh, we'll decide what to do next uh, Sunday. Love you, people. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for being with us today, helping us with your word, slicing into us with that word. <coughs> May we live the lives that best reflect our relationship with you. May our church minister and help bear the burdens of those around us. May each of us rejoice in the freedom that you have given us. In the name of Jesus, amen. All righty, we'll see you, everybody. Say hello to all the visitors. Anybody you don't know. Thanks for watching. I don't know if I was upside down or not. But